grateful to be here with you all today and grateful to be offering this sermon. There's so many different names this could have been, but I called it The Secret People Turning the World, Jewish Mysticism for Our Times. There are multiple concepts and teachings that come from the Judaic faith tradition that offer wisdom and truth and meaning that perhaps are more relevant now than in the times in which the stories and, and concepts were written. A perpetually breaking world and a hidden group of people, Jewish mysticism is here offering inspiration to us, especially while we contemplate our personal role in the healing and restoration of humanity and our hurting planet. Today, I intend to offer stories and ideas that might just help us persevere and even thrive during these uncertain and ever-changing times. I share a personal story with you that I think kind of captures the breadth of the two concepts that I'm going to be talking about today from Jewish mysticism. Years ago, my family was going through some significant money challenges. I'd recently found out that I was pregnant, and although my heart longed for the pregnancy, it caused me overwhelming anxiety. At the time, we had two young daughters, and the idea of twins was fraught with insufficiencies, burdenous money worries, panic, and stress. The Sunday after I found out that I was pregnant with twins, I took my daughters to church for the very first time. Off we went to our first Sunday service at a local Christian church. We sat amidst the congregation, listening, singing new to us songs. Everything was beautiful until the offertory. The offertory is a time in a service when congregants are invited to gift money upon the church's offering plate. We have one, we don't pass it anymore. Or is it Ken? It's over there. <laughs> You're invited to gift as you choose, as you are able. But as the offering plate began to go around, my heart sank. I was flooded with overwhelming sadness and shame that I didn't have even a penny to offer the plate. I cringed. We shouldn't have been there. How could I have brought my daughters to church without considering the offering plate? Quiet tears rolled down my cheeks as we sang the Lord's Prayer and the plates were passed around to everyone. And then I recognized that lack of money was neither a sin nor a crime. <clears throat> so my guilt lightened as I tried to forgive myself our financial predicament, both of that moment in the church and in my life. At the end of the service, my daughters and I grasped hands and we got up to leave. A man I'd never met before greeted my children and he appeared to be homeless his clothes were very worn and dirty, and he smelled really unpleasant. He seemed to slur his speech, perhaps a speech impediment or perhaps residual effects of recently drank alcohol. Despite his appearance, I wasn't put off by him, nor his eagerness to connect with my daughters. I smiled directly at him and looked deeply into his eyes. He said to my daughters, girls, you sure are pretty. I want you to have something, but I'll give it to your mama because she'll know what to do with it. The man grinned as he handed me a dollar bill. My jaw dropped. <laughs> How was it possible that a homeless, perhaps man, was giving me what was probably his only money? We were dressed in our best clean clothes, so our appearance didn't seemed to beckon such kindness or donation, yet here he was somehow addressing my very private deficiency. That moment was truly magic. My need to give any amount of money to the donation plate felt so great, the burden almost too much for me to bear, and yet who was this unlikely man who likely had monetary deficits greater than my own standing before us, giving us what we needed in that very moment. I accepted the dollar, which felt like a million, and I thanked him again as tears started streaming down my face. 
And as we walked out of the church, I was greeted by the church's pastor, whom I'd never met before. And I shared the experience with him. I told him about the situation and that I had this money. And he too was astonished and touched. And then I was able to give him the miraculous money. Magic and miracles are constantly happening all the time around us. In the wise words of Elder Mick Jagger, you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Life unceasingly and often unawaringly brings us what we need in each and every moment. We have to open our hearts and drop any preconceived judgments or notions of the moment to witness and to receive abundant gifts that serve us. By being fully present and open, we shall receive all we need and more. Today, I'll offer two concepts and two challenges for each of you this week, if you choose to accept, that are inspired by Judaism. The, I, these, are, these two particular ideas have blessed my own awareness and contemplation of, well, humanity, our suffering, and our own role in the potential healing of ourselves, one another, and our earth. Tikkun Olam and the Lamed Vavniks. I'll start sharing about Tikkun Olam and it was probably about 13 years ago that I first saw this movie, which I strongly recommend. It's a really fabulous movie. It's called Bee Season with Richard Gere. Uh, it's about um, uh, this man who is a religious teacher in a university and his daughter um, who does spelling bees. It's really fantastic. I love spelling bees things. But anyway, but this extract, this little thing that I'm going to read to you is something that he's teaching to his university class about tikkun olam. So I'll pretend to be Richard Gere. Get my gear on. God is everything, a perfect, luminous, essence but even god wants more to experience more to give so god creates a vessel a container that can receive this gift of god's pure light this divine light pours into the vessel and the vessel of course cannot contain the magnitude of this light and it shatters destroying the vessel and scattering the broken shards in a big bang of creation now, a man's job is to locate and gather up these shards to make the vessel, our world, whole again. The Kabbalists call this fixing, this mending, tikkun olam, fixing of the world. Any act of goodness, altruism, kindness that contributes to that idea is considered tikkun olam. It's an extraordinary idea that we can restore what has been shattered. In fact, it's our responsibility to try each of us out of the very pieces of destruction. God has left us hope. That was my gear. <laughs> I first encountered this concept, tikkun olam, and it stayed with me. And I've, everywhere I go, I carry tikkun olam. Like, it's like my spiritual weather report of what's happening around me, the state of the world. It differs when I place my attention on this currency of tikkun olam, this live stream, instead of the one in my living room or coming through my internet or my computer. My live streams for tikkun olam come from grocery store aisles and checkouts school carpool lines, from coffee shops, from businesses, offices, from here, from Zoom rooms, even hello, everybody in Zoom. Everywhere I go, I give my attention to, to everywhere I go that I give my attention to tikkun olam, I find ordinary unknown people committing so many extraordinary good deeds, acts of kindness, offering the healing presence and love the world so desperately needs. While tikkun olam has become a social justice font, a love cry for many Jewish Americans, it seems tikkun olam is not actually a common shared or acknowledged concept among the majority of Jewish in Israel. 
researching the history of the phrase and evolution of tikkun olam reveals a journey of a seed of an idea that came from a prayer, the Eleinu prayer, and actually and did not actually stem from religious scriptures. There are many Jewish people and organizations across America cultivating awareness and action around tikkun olam while also reading the Torah and practicing other Judaic customs and rituals. I'd be remiss right now to not share, though, that there are many Jewish people who believe the concept of tikkun olam as blasphemous, as they believe it somehow diminishes the traditional teachings of Judaism. As my personal understanding and contemplation of tikkun olam is continuing to mature, I notice not only the ways people offer kindness and love to others toward repair, but also witness how we humans continue to do and create things, propagating the myth of separation, destruction, and continuous splintering. Nothing worth considering, save love, 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 is without controversy. I like to talk about the second concept, the Lamed Vavniks. There are many different ways of spelling it, and probably I'm not saying it completely properly either. There's probably different ways of saying it, S spelling it and saying it. And um, this is a concept from Judaic tradition that is particularly fascinating to me as well, the Lamed Vavniks. They are the hidden 36 saints or people that are responsible for the continuation of the world. If something happened to them, the world would stop, the world would cease. In Hebrew numerology, Lamed means 30 and Vav, V-A-V, means six. So I'd like to start as we explore Lamed Vavniks by sharing something that happened with my eldest daughter, Abby and I, when we went to New York City a few years ago. A few years ago, you may remember, um, you all were so supportive in us going on that trip to New York. As part of our trip, we had a commitment to create and distribute care packages to people who appeared to be homeless or in need, whom we encountered during our trip. And thank you to many of you for your donations for the supplies to the kits. We, the kits contain things like wipes and socks, toothbrushes, toothpaste, band-aids, granola bars, and other things that people living on the streets might be helped with. We transported and distributed 20 kits to people where we stayed. We stayed near Lincoln Theater and we toured a couple of different colleges while we were there. One afternoon we were walking together and we came across a woman who was sitting on an, a flipped upside down crate on the side of you know, the, the road. She asked us for some money and so we stopped to talk with her. And she told us how she was homeless but she was about to get a new place as some housing had become available and she was really excited about the changes coming to her. Getting housing in Brooklyn meant to her that she'd be able to apply and hopefully find a job that would enable her to keep her new apartment. We talked to her for a while, listening and learning about her challenges and the plight and the catch-22 nature of her situation. Abby gave her two of the care packages and we both wished her well and we continued our walk up the street. We crossed an intersection, went through the light and kept walking and then suddenly our eyes fell upon the same woman sitting upon a crate on the same side of the street we were walking, but just one street up. Abby and I just looked at each other in bewilderment and looked at the woman. We didn't know what to say or do. It was incredulous. The sight of her was such a shock. I finally said to Abby, I believe in angels. She must be an angel. And Abby and I just laughed, feeling as if we had seen a ghost. I wonder though now, really, was she a Lamed Vavnik? So I'm going to share a reading now that um, was the first reading that came to me as I shared the first experience of Tikkun Olam through that film. I've read and there's so many things, just Google it. It is so fantastic and phenomenal to read these things. But this came from this a beautiful book called My Grandfather's Blessings by Rachel Naomi Remen. And uh, it's a, a, a beautiful collection of essays. And this I've kind of reworked a little bit um, for time here. 
So this is, this is her words. So the story my grandfather told me is very old and dates from the time of the prophet Isaiah. It is the legend of the Lamed Vav. In this story, God tells us that he will allow the world to continue as long as any given time there is a minimum of 36 good people in the human race. People who are capable of responding to the suffering that is a part of the human condition. These 36 are called the Lamed Vav. If at any time there are fewer than 36 such people alive, the world will come to an end. Do you know who these people are, Grandpa? I asked, certain that he would say yes. But he shook his head. No, Nashumle, he told me. Only God knows who the Lamed Vavniks are. Even the Lamed Vavniks themselves do not know for sure the role they have in the continuation of our world. And no one else knows either. They respond to suffering, not in order to save the world, but simply because the suffering of others touches them and matters to them. It turned out that Lamed Vavniks could be tailors, college professors, millionaires, paupers, powerful leaders, or powerless victims. These things were not important. What mattered was only their capacity to feel the collective suffering of the human race and to respond to the suffering around them. And because no one knows who they are, Nishumle, anyone you might meet might be one of the 36 for whom God preserves the world, my grandfather said. It's important to treat everyone as if it might be so. I sat and thought about this story for a long time, says Rachel. How do the Lamed Vavniks respond to suffering, Grandpa? I asked suddenly anxiously. What, what do they have to do? My grandfather smiled at me tenderly. Ah, Nashumle, he told me. They do not need to do anything. They respond to all suffering with compassion. Without compassion, the world cannot continue. Our compassion blesses and sustains the world. The end of her extract from the essay. This essay inspired me to read so many other things and seek out videos that considered the Lamed Vavniks of the world. The origin of this tradition comes from the Babylonian Talmud. There are not less than 36 righteous men in the world who receive the divine presence from Sanhedrin 97b in the Babylonian Talmud. Now think about it. 36 people in the entire world might be responsible for the continuation of the world. Okay, yes, it's mystical. <laughs> <laughs> but just stay with me for a minute. <laughs> I mean, what happens, look to your left, look to your right. <laughs> if the person seated next to you, and in Zoom, look to the square to your left and your right and above in the Brady Bunch squares there. Or what happens if you are one of them? Just ask yourself that. How would you treat yourself or how would you treat people if you thought they were. In closing, I'd like to share um, something that Rabbi Rami Shapiro wrote about the Secret 36 in his book, The Sacred Art of Loving Kindness. And he writes, without their acts of loving kindness, life on this planet would implode under the weight of human selfishness, anger, ignorance and greed. The tipping point for maintaining human life on this planet is 36 people practicing the sacred art of loving kindness at any given moment. They need not be the same 36 people at each moment. However, I believe that people step into and out of the Medvavnik role. And, that it, and once you realize that the whole world depends on you for its very survival, you will not lack in opportunities to serve. Just remember, you are a hidden saint. While it is fine to invite others to join with you, make sure you don't advertise it though, not your own saintliness. While being a Lamed Vavnik may be good for your soul, it doesn't belong on a resume. <laughs> 
So I have two assignments for you. I'm going to call them home play. This week and perhaps beyond as me in the years now of these this continuing life play. And um, so should you choose to accept, you may wish to look at the world, the news, your trip to the grocery store, your daily routine through the, the lenses of Tikkun Olam, the healing of the world, and the Lamed Vavniks. How might your actions be connected to and through Tikkun Olam and the Hidden 36? Just think about it. And then if you'd like, shoot me an email. Let me know what comes up, because I'm really curious. I'd love to know. Amen, blessed be, ashe, our woman, our human. It is so. Shalom. <laughs>